Well, yes, welcome everyone to GeoHug. So before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Aurora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And yes, I'm so excited to have Stuart Simmons joining us today. Stuart is a consulting geologist with Hot Solutions Limited in New Zealand and a research professor at the University of Utah, as well as the SEG president for 2023. He's primarily known for his work on epithermal deposits and geothermal resources. His work is directed at understanding the geological, hydrological and geochemical controls on hydrothermal fluid flow, precious metal mineralization and heat transfer. And with his extensive experience, it is going to be amazing to hear from him today about the origin of the world's most powerful geyser, my mongoose. So thank you so much. It's gonna be an amazing session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat and we'll open up the floor for some discussions at the end. And yes, thanks so much, Jill, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thanks, Jessica. It's great to be here. Geysers are rare planetary phenomena resulting from the cyclic discharge and fountaining of a two-phase fluid. On Earth, they are associated with discharges of boiling water to produce white jets and billowing clouds of steam. And because of their rarity, many are protected by national parks and reserves around the world. Studies of geysers have taken on an additional currency for study because of speculations that changes in behavior might be related to imminent volcanic eruption. This presentation covers the behavior and origins of the Waimungu geyser, which played from 1900 to 1904. Extraordinary was the height of individual eruptions ranging from 100 to 400 meters, making it the largest and most powerful geyser known. A record of historic photos provide a time series of the events leading up to its outbreak and subsequent demise. These combined with a modern understanding of the surrounding hot springs and hydrothermal activity provide a basis for interpreting the geyser's origin. So without further ado, let's get started. The site is located in the North Island of New Zealand, approximately 20 kilometers southeast of Rotorua, and it is easily accessible and a major tourist attraction for reasons you will shortly appreciate. To start, geysers are found around the world, and many are associated with active centers of volcanism, but this is not exclusively the case. The term derives from the name of the Great Geyser in Iceland. Their beauty and aesthetic attributes captivate our attention. The photo shows an erupting geyser at El Tadio, Chile, at an elevation at 4,200 4, meters above sea level, one of the highest elevation geyser fields known. Before getting too far along, it is useful to have a conceptual understanding about the hydrothermal system that hosts the geyser. This is shown schematically, and the yellow plume marks the buoyant column of hot, deeply circulated water that convects through the upper crust in response to intrusion of magma. Such systems have been drilled around the world to produce geothermal energy, providing information about the temperature gradient to as much as three kilometers depth. Accordingly, it is known that the boiling point for depth curve, which is shown on the right, represents the maximum temperature at any given depth as controlled by the overlying hydrostatic pressure. That is the pressure due to the weight of a hot water column. Thus at 500 meters, the maximum achievable temperature is 250 degrees C, and at 1,000 meters depth, it is 300 degrees C. The inverted triangle shows where such conditions might be reached, corresponding to the upflow zone of the hydrothermal system. It is above such regions that geysers play. At the surface of the hydrothermal system, boiling discharge of the upflow zone is frequently seen in hot springs surrounded by silica sinter, steaming ground, mud pots, and sometimes as geysers. Yellowstone Park in the USA is famous for its more than 500 geysers, including Old Faithful, which draws a throng of tourists each summer. For those who are patient and tenacious, it is possible to also glimpse an eruption of the largest active geyser called Steamboat Geyser. Unlike Old Faithful, its behavior is erratic and intervals of dormancy have lasted for up to 50 years. After a relatively long period of quiescence, 
it came back to life in 2018, and it has remained in a phase of relatively frequent eruption ever since. Up until relatively recently, the geometry of the plumbing underlying geysers has been speculated. A few decades ago, models involved quite elaborate interconnections between eccentrically shaped open cavities. The lowering of teleview viewer cameras down the throats of geyser vents, however, suggests the plumbing is much simpler and in the form of a subvertical pipe. Such features act as a nozzle which compresses and accelerates the upward expanding column of boiling two-phase fluid so that it discharges as a fountain of hot water and steam. The Cassini mission to the outer reaches of the solar system proved that geysers are not bound to Earth. Here, photos of Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, taken in low angle sunlight, show eruptions to more than 10 kilometers height, comprising fountains of ice crystals. Tantalizingly, they appear to be supplying one of the rings of Saturn. These towering jets of fluid and ice are sourced from a salty ocean that underlies a thick crust of ice erupting through large-scale slots called tiger stripes. I want you to keep the concept of a slot as a control on geysering in mind when considering the origins of the Waimungu geyser. Returning to Earth, I mentioned that the drilling of deep geothermal wells provides a picture of the thermal structure, but they also give information regarding geological context and an opportunity to sample and analyze the chemistry of hydrothermal fluids. Such wells are shown in the cross section on the right as vertical lines extending from 1,000 to more than 2,000 meters depth. With temperatures exceeding 275 degrees C, the extent of a large reservoir of hot liquid under hydrostatic pressure is mapped out. The photo on the left shows a well on discharge, and this only occurs for short duration as part of production testing not long after the well is completed. The well is self-flowing due to flashing, which forms an upward expanding column of hot water and steam, and similar processes op operate when geysers erupt. The Wamangu geyser played for just four years from 1900 to 1904. In addition to many eyewitness accounts, there are numerous photos that document its behavior. Eruptive activity lasted several hours, separated by periods of quiescence, lasting about 36 hours. Such cyclicity is why it is called a geyser. But the eruptions were exceptionally powerful, jetting hot water, steam, and rocks. The latter, along with fine particles of sand and mud, give the eruption column its dark appearance. And the name Waimangu means black water in Toreo Maori. During periods of activity, there could be multiple eruptions regularly reaching heights of 100 to 150 meters, with rare shots to 400 meters. As I will show, the geyser plumbing was largely produced by the Tarawera volcanic eruption that occurred in 1886. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the hydrothermal, hydrothermal plume underlying the surface provides a large natural reservoir of hot hydrothermal liquid under hydrostatic pressure. The last thing to point out is that the estimates of geysering power outputs are on the order of 500 to 750 megawatts thermal. These are the first three slides showing the geyser in eruption. On the left, the tourists are lined up behind a rope, which is meant to signify the safe viewing distance. In both photos, the trails of ballistic rock fragments are clearly evident. The power of eruptions is thus represented by the lifting of clastic material comprising bombs, sand, and mud. The apron deposit on the left shows the surface littered with eruption debris, and bombs up to 30 centimeters across are described in newspaper accounts. These are a far cry from the behavior of geysers today, and Waimungu has no active analog. As mentioned, geyser activity was the subject of numerous photographs and these help document the variation in eruption style. Many photos were shot from near the encampment in the photo right, which housed a temporary studio. This view, taken from the opposite direction, looks back into the geyser cauldron during the interval of quiescence. The pool had a dimension of roughly 135 by 85 meters. And on a dare, a local guide named Alfred Warbrick and his companion, Mr. Buckeridge, crossed the hot lakelet during one such interval 
in a wooden rowboat in 1903. And apart from the demonstration of bravado, they did carry a sounding rope with them and measured a maximum depth of less than 15 meters. This is probably surprising, but it's no doubt that the material that was erupted just falls back into the cauldron, and so it probably has a shallow depth. Soon after finishing this crossing, the geyser started erupting. The upper right photo shows the fearless duo in their hot water adventure. Three weeks later, Alfred's brother was guiding three tourists, and the four of them were engulfed by an unexpected blast from the geyser. And they all perished, and it is said that this was the geyser's revenge on Alfred's earlier escapade. In 1901, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and York made the royal visit to New Zealand and Australia. Fragments of some of the earliest film recordings ever made as part of the occasion document the eruption of the Waimung geyser. The cameraman was Joseph Perry. This short clip shows the pulsating nature of eruptions. Unlike many geysers, there is no sustained discharge of fluid. Instead, what one can see is a punctuated series of energetic eruptions. To understand the origin of the Waimungu geyser, we need to step back and consider the geological context in recent prehistory. The geyser cauldron developed in the eastern corner of Echo Crater, which in itself had only formed 14 years earlier as a consequence of the 1886 eruption of Mount Tarawera. The liniment of craters transecting Mount Tarawera and extending southwestward to Waimungu runs for 16 kilometers in length. It formed in the early morning hours of 10 June 1886. Mount Tarawera is a composite rhyolite dome complex, having built up inside the Haroharo caldera over the previous 20,000 years. During the 1886 event, basalt rather than rhyolite was erupted. The eruption lasted for three to four hours, and apart from the line of crater vents, created short-lived zones of boiling, first related to the phreatomagmatic phase of the eruption when basalt erupted through Lake Rotamahana, and then later on during subsequent hydrothermal eruptions and geysering. Up until the 1886 Tarawera eruption, Lake Rotamahana was a major attraction in its own right. The then much smaller and shallower lake was ringed by hot spring activity that included the spectacular pink and white terraces. Two grand silica center terraces stepped up from lake level by 25 meters and they were fed by geysering springs from on top. The human figures on the left bottom side of the image give you a sense of their scale. But they were not just subjects of early photographers as numerous artists celebrated their natural beauty. The eruption of Mount Tarawera, however, sealed their fate. The whole event occurred under the cover of darkness commencing after midnight with precursor ground shaking. Fire fountaining broke out and played across the summit starting about 2 p.m. And an hour and a half later, the fissure opened up, unzipping to the southwest, driving hot magma through the hydrothermal system. By 5 a.m., it was over. In its aftermath, what had been one of the world's then great tourist attractions was destroyed along with the shallow Lake Rotamahana. In its place, a new large crater had been excavated from which steam is billowing in this photograph. Approximately a half a cubic kilometer of material was ejected and redistributed as, as a blanket over the countryside, creating a landscape devoid of vegetation. There were scores of fatalities, including many Maori who lived in the vicinity. At the southwesternmost end, new craters had formed, including Inferno and Echo craters. Photographs at the time suggest these depressions filled up with cold rainwater, and it was not until 1891 that any sign of hot spring discharge became evident. In the meantime, a new Lake Rotamahana had filled in with a, a maximum depth of 125 meters. In the process of refilling, the pressure and temperature gradients in the subsurface that had been impacted by the volcanic eruption were being reestablished and this, has, this might have much to do with the subsequent outbreak of the Waimungu geyser.
The Waimungu geyser was first recognized from afar by clouds of steam, and eyewitness accounts of its eruption were not documented until early 1901. This photo, in which the figures are running towards the geyser, was posed for a publicity shot. A view from the opposite direction and looking down on the geyser cauldron shows the flat bottom basin of Echo Crater called Frying Pan Flat. The orange filled diamond marks the camera location in the previous photo. Lower right is the outflow channel from Inferno Crater, which served as a barometer. Its discharge would cease about an hour prior to, to when the geysering would commence. And in the far distance is a new tourist accommodation house that had been built to accommodate visitors to the area. This is a slightly later photo from a similar vantage point, but after the geyser ceased to play. When it stopped, newspaper articles report that numerous attempts were made to restart the geyser. Unfortunately, no, no details were provided. The main thing is that you can clearly see the outline of the cauldron where the geyser previously played with frying pan flat in the background. And there really is nothing significant to attribute to the termination of its play. Additional outbreaks would ensue, and the biggest was the 1917 eruption of Frying Pan Flat, which lasted for three days. This was a purely hydrothermal event, and there is no evidence that it was stimulated by volcanic activity. The earliest phases of eruption had a sub-horizontal trajectory that fatefully lined up with the new tourist accommodation house that I mentioned earlier. Its destruction is captured here from behind and you can see the timbers and roofing materials in the riv ravine in the foreground. The guide who lived there survived, but his wife and daughter died three weeks later in a Rotorua hospital from burns they had received. This aerial view provides a clearer picture of the apron deposit of breccia that was distributed as a result of the 1917 eruption. Frying pan flat was now replaced with a hot lakelet. This map shows the modern hot spring activity as colored triangles, squares, and circles in comparison to the location of the pink and white terraces and the ancestral Lake Rotamahana. As a result of the 1886 Tarawera volcanic eruption and subsequent refilling of a new much larger Lake Rotamahana, hot spring activity re-emerged along the western lakeshore and in the vicinity of the vol volcanic craters that form new fluid pathways in the Waimungu Valley. These three panels portray the broad change in hydrology with the orange color representing the hot, deeply circulated hydrothermal chloride water. In A, steady state boiling upflow fed the springs around the shallow pre-1886 Lake Rotamahana. For such large silica center terraces to form, this must have been a long-lived condition. In B, the time is late 1886 post-dating the Tarawera eruption, when new craters had formed. These provided greatly enhanced permeability, allowing cold groundwater to infiltrate the shallow regime, creating sharp pressure temperature gradients that may have induced flow instabilities related to the outbreak of the Waimungu geyser and subsequent hydrothermal eruptions at Frying Pan Flat. In C, the present day condition is shown in which steady state boiling upflow is reestablished. Throughout, the Waimungu geyser is simply a consequence of the hydrological changes wrought by the 1886 eruption. I have just a few more slides, and I want to touch on aspects of two-phase fluid flow conditions applicable to geysering. I'll start with drawing an analogy with a production well, which seems reasonable in light of what is known about geyser plumbing. In the middle panel, the upward expanding column of a two-phase fluid starts deep in the well at the red line labeled boiling level. The distribution of steam and liquid is only schematically portrayed, and a more useful view of flow regimes and phase distribution is shown on the far right. By the time the two-phase fluid reaches the surface, it is traveling at near sonic velocity in annular flow mode. With increasing depth, the modes of flow include churn, slug, and bubble. Of particular interest is the difference in pressure gradient between the hydrostatic column that surrounds the well and the flowing gradient inside the well, as represented by the continuous and dotted lines in black. 
as these show what drives energetic discharge during geysering. At deep level, the flowing gradient is underpressured, and this is because the two-phase column of overlying fluid is less dense than the single-phase liquid only column outside the well. As a result, fluid is sucked into the well. That is, it's self-flowing. At shallow level, however, the fluid inside the well is overpressured with respect to the hydrostatic gradient. And if not for the casing, erosion of the conduit would inevitably ensue. For the Waimungu geyser, this gives us some clues that the rock fragments and sand and mud might have been entrained at just very shallow levels along the flow path. It is also worth pointing out the evidence of modern cyclic flow between Frying Pan Lake and Inferno Crater based on continuous monitor monitoring. On the right, the graph shows the change in outflow from Frying Pan Lake as a function of time during which it rises from 100 liters per second to a maximum of about 120 liters per second, falling back to 100 liters per second over a 38-day period. At the same time, the water level in the nearby Inferno Crater falls then rises nearly 10 meters. Both features are fed by boiling hot water, and it has been suggested that the oscillation represents some sort of cryptic geysering. The longer record of fluctuation is shown on the bottom to illustrate the regular nature of the cyclic discharge. That we have good data on the outflow from Frying Pan Lake for decades provides, an in, uh, provides a basis for assessing the thermal power output of the Waimungu geyser. Both features are hosted by the same conduit. So by simply compressing the period of discharge measured continuously from Frying Pan Lake to the period of geyser play, one can calculate a thermal power output of 500 to 750 megawatts. Both the volcanic eruption and geysering, as well as modern hydrothermal fluid flow, are related to a deeply penetrating subvertical structure forming an on-echelon array of extensional fissures. The segment running through Echo Crater clearly localized energetic fluid flow, first in the form of the Waimungu geyser on the eastern tip, and then later with the hydrothermal eruption forming Frying Pan Lake. This situation resembles the circumstances for geysering on Enceladus, wherein the fissure provides a slot that is controlling fluid ascent and discharge. The role of dilatant fissures as a control on shallow hydrothermal flow is seen elsewhere. In this photo of the Opal Mound at Roosevelt Hot Springs, a high temperature hydrothermal system in the United States, a vertical structure transects a hot spring deposit of silica sinter, showing the control of boiling hot water discharge over a thousand years ago. We can also look at epithermal vein deposits as examples of fissures controlling fluid flow. In the Favona vein deposit in Waihe, located in the Hauraki gold fields of New Zealand, mineralogical textures indicate that the bulk of the vein filling involved a highly energetic boiling regime. These combined with evidence of particle transport and brecciation share a commonality with the Waimungu geyser. And I'd go so far as to suggest that the flow regimes of both are directly analogous. The overlap between geyserine and epithermal vein formation is a subject that requires more time to elaborate. And for now, I just want to show the cross-section of the upward branching vein system as being representative of high flux conduits, each one of which potentially facilitated an energetic flow regime. The green-filled volume on the upper right marks a relatively thick interval of hydrothermal vent breaches that is capped by silica sinter and steam-heated acid sulfate alteration. I want to suggest that this represents the plumbing of some of the largest geysers never seen having occurred in the geologic past. In summary, the Waimungu geyser is the most powerful geyser known. Its origin is linked to the formation of volcanic craters and vents that formed in the early morning hours of 10 June 1886. The eruption of Mount Tarawera included explosive interaction between intruding basalt magma and a long-lived hydrothermal system, which caused irreversible change to the nature of pathways controlling hydrothermal fluid flow. Geysering and hydrothermal eruptions that ensued over 15 years later are attributed to the subsequent evolution 
an adjustment of pressure gradients in response to perturbations stimulated by the 1886 er event. In particular, the forceful eruptions accompanying play of the Waimungu geyser were driven by deep boiling and upward expansion of a two-phase fluid column through an extensional fissure that formed a nozzle. The Waimungu geyser, geothermal production wells, and epithermal veins are all strongly similar in terms of their plumbing and energetic flow, fluid flow regimes. Lastly, although rare, geysering is a natural feature of hydrothermal activity, and it is a process or a feature that forms repeatedly through geological time, including other planets and moons. In closing, I just want to acknowledge the profound contribution Ron Keem made to the understanding of the Waimungu geyser and the evolution of hydrothermal activity in, in the vicinity since before the 1886 eruption of Mount Tarawera. The photographs I've shown you were ones I first saw in a presentation made by Ron in the late 1980s to a group of geothermal students at the University of Auckland. The site has captivated me ever since. And in this photo, Ron is seen out on Frying Pan Lake measuring the bathymetry of the hot lakelet with his usual focused determination. Thanks very much.